Give John Bevere a big hand as he comes to bring the word. I love you, buddy. Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing this morning at nine? Hey, stay standing because you know I always love to pray. <laughs> That's just a, okay, that's one of my traditions. Anyway, it's important though. I don't just do it to do it. You know, I love these morning meetings. I, 18th Victory Word Explosion. I have relished these times. I, there's just something really special when people come out this early in the morning to hear the Word of God. And uh, we're all hungry in here. We are all love Jesus. We all want to see the kingdom advanced. And so it's just really, really a great atmosphere. I'm going to probably go to a level of like talking to leaders today. So I'm going to treat you all as leaders. I mean, doesn't God say we're the head and not the tail? We're above only and not beneath. And so before I, I get right into this message this morning, I really do want to pray that God would give me the words, but not only the words, but his heart to deliver it. I really believe that there's something very key that needs to be inserted into the body of Christ. That's why I wrote this book called Killing Kryptonite. Okay, Killing Kryptonite, what is this title all about? Well, we all know, you know, unless you've been on some deserted island for 60 years, I mean, Superman is like a folklore almost. And we all know that he had otherworldly powers. And there was something that neutralized his powers, and it was called kryptonite. And he wasn't aware of it until he actually came upon it and was affected by it. Even so, there is a spiritual kryptonite that weakens us. And so that's the subtitle, Destroy That Which Weakens You. And um, it's, it's a 28-chapter book. And I finally woke up to the fact that, hey, people are so busy, they don't have time to read these long chapters. I mean, yes, many people do it, but I'm going to try to make it easier. So I prayed before I wrote it, and I said, Holy Spirit, can you give me this book in 28 chapters? Little bite-sized chapters. So they're all 2,500 words, which that takes about 12 minutes to read. So people can do them every single day for four weeks, 28 days. It's actually a four-section book. It's all set up for, uh, you know, a four-week book. And um, so it's impossible to talk about it. I'm even not even going to go into kryptonite this morning, okay? But I'm just going to cover two of the chapters at the very end of the book that I feel are very, very prophetic for right now and helping prepare people for our days ahead. Listen, I hear it over and over in my spirit. The days that are just before us are mind-blowing, okay? They will literally rival and maybe even supersede, and I personally believe supersede what happened in the book of Acts. And so, listen, this is the generation. This is when it's going to begin to happen. And I'm excited about it, amen? So I just want to believe that God's going to prepare us to be proper carriers of what he wants to do in these final days. I believe this church is going to be right in the middle of what he's doing in these last days, not only in Tulsa, but in this nation and around the world. I mean, God is preparing you. Can you say amen? amen. All right, so let's pray and let's really believe. And, and before I pray, let me just say one more thing, because I want to go right into it at once I pray. I realized last night I opened up a can of worms, okay, <laughs> and kind of left you on the cliff as far as calling goes. I do talk about how to recognize what you're called to do in the book, Driven by Attorney. So if you're able to get that book, great. But I realized there needed to be a lot more done. So last fall, I did an entire online course, and it's called Called. <laughs> That's the title of the course. The entire course, it's just me sitting around a table with some millennials, and I go through how to discover your calling. And I go into it much greater in depth than I do in Even Driven by Attorneys. So if you're interested, you can go to unlockyourcalling.com and get that course and go through it, all right? So let's pray and believe God speaks to us today. Heavenly Father, thank you for what you're doing in victory, what you've done in the past, we celebrate. But Lord, there's such a great future for this church, for this ministry that is literally touching the world. And so today I'm asking, Holy Spirit, please help me to deliver the message that you've entrusted to me to deliver to your church. I'm asking that you would not only give me the words that you desire to be spoken, but I would say it with the heart of Jesus. Let it be as if Jesus was standing here speaking to us personally. Because Lord, we know that none of us can do nothing in our own ability. 
But we must have your anointing, your grace upon our lives to be able to do anything worth eternal value. So let there be a great weight of eternal value that comes forth as a result of what is spoken in here this morning. There are hungry people that are standing before you this morning. We are hungry. Feed us. Nurture us. Build us up so that we can change this world, so that we can bring the kingdom of God into Tulsa, into the United States, and into the nations of this world. We're so excited. We're excited about what you're about to do in our lives, through our lives. In Jesus' mighty name, we give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise. And everybody that agrees says amen. amen. Let's thank him in advance for what he's going to do. Amen, amen, amen. You can be seated. You know, can I just say this? Um, I got saved in 1979 in my fraternity, and I got saved and fell in love with Jesus. And you know what my number one goal is in life? That I'm more in love with Jesus when I leave this world than when I got saved in my fraternity. Amen? And I, I would hope that that would be your passion. I would think that is your passion. Don't ever let anything sidetrack you from loving Jesus Christ. Amen? All right, now... Jesus has been raised from the dead, and we have this book after his resurrection called the book of Revelation. And this book was given to, by, to the apostle John on the deserted island of Patmos. At the beginning of this book, we have two chapters, chapters two and chapter three, where Jesus actually addresses seven historic churches in Asia. All right, now, these are historic churches. They existed Rick Renner has done an amazing book on this. However, they never would have been put in the scriptures if they didn't have prophetic application. In other words, what he said to those seven churches apply to us today. And the Holy Spirit has shined a light on one of these churches real recently in my life in prayer. And he has actually showed me that this is a very important message for the church of the United States. And so I want to open up by reading what Jesus says here. He says, uh, write this, and this is Revelation 2, verse 18. Write this letter to the angel. Now, the word angel is simply the Greek word agulos, which means messenger, or we could say it today in more relevant terms, to the pastor of the church of Thyatira. Now, I want you to really notice this is not the city of Tyra, Thyatira. This is the church. This is a message Jesus is speaking to his own covenant people. He says, this is a message from the Son of God. Remember, this is not Old Testament Jesus. This is New Testament Jesus. Some people think like that. I don't. Jesus is never Old Testament to me. But anyway, I need to point this out. This is post-resurrection. Look what he says to this church. He said, I know all the things you do. I have seen your love. Everybody shout love. love. Your faith. faith. Your service. And your patience, your patient endurance, excuse me. Now, I want to point out here, this church is filled with love and it's acknowledged by Jesus as being full of love. I have noticed in 35 years of ministry, the first thing that leaves a ministry or a church when it begins to die is the love of God. You will see in the book of, uh, in the book of Revelation, the very first church he addresses he says, hey, you, you don't put up with people that call themselves apostles but aren't. They're false. You have patience. You have endured tribulations, but you have left your first love. The first symptom of a ministry or church dying is love begins to wane. Okay? It's not true with this church. I want you to notice what he says. We're going to put this back up on the board. He says, and I can see your constant improvement in all these things. Now, I want you to really stop and think about what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with the church that is constantly improving in love, in faith, and faith is so important because you can't please God without it, in service. So this is an outreach church. This is a church that's serving their community, their region, and the world. And in their patient endurance. So Jesus is like bragging on them in these areas. And I'm going to tell you as a leader, if I was a leader of a church, I would love having Jesus say this about our church. 
that you're constantly improving in these four extremely important areas. So I want to get... I want to get this picture laid out here, okay? This is not a decaying church. This is not an irrelevant church. This is not an out-of-date church. This is not an old-school dying church. This is a great church, okay? But now, look what he goes on to say. He says, but I have this complaint against you. Wow, okay? Now we're about to hear something different. You are permitting that woman... That Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet, to lead my servants astray. Now, I have done a lot of reading on commentaries about this statement right here. First of all, most commentaries agree that this was not the name of a historic woman. So in other words, there wasn't this woman in this church physically named Jezebel. Why? They've done lots of research in the Greek, Greek Roman history. They find no woman that has any prominence in, in this church, she can't be found. And I'm going to tell you, I agree with these commentaries because look what Jesus says. He says, that woman, look at this, that Jezebel. So in other words, like uh, John Daughtery is hilarious. And if I was referring to John Daughtery in the Daughtery family, I would say, that comedian. Okay, everybody would know who I'm talking about. Because John has just got the funniest personality, right? I mean, I've never had so much fun doing a wedding in my life as when I did John and Charissa's, right? When they break danced out of this building in front of 3,000 people, I was just like, these guys are hilarious. And we would say he's that comedian. This is what Jesus is saying about this particular influential woman. He's calling her that Jezebel. And what is she doing? She's leading God's servants astray. How is she doing it? Sexual immorality and food offered to idols. Now, I don't literally think the problem was they were eating food offered to idols because Paul justifies it in Romans 14 and 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He said, hey, if you eat food that's been offered to an idol and you bless it and you give thanks and your conscience is clear, it's fine. So it's not so much, and all the commentaries agree, it's not so much the fact that they're eating food, sacrificed to idols, it's the fact that what she's doing, her teaching, is leading them astray, and it's causing them to do things that are immoral and ungodly. And so historians say that this woman and her leaders are creating apathy and immorality in the servants in the church. Okay? I, re I believe the reason Jesus gives her the brand of that Jezebel is her effects are exactly like what the Jezebel of first and second kings did with God's people. She led them into a stupor. You will remember Elijah had to speak out against her and say, hey Israel, wake up. How long are you gonna be indecisive? Halted between two opinions. Are you gonna serve God or are you gonna tolerate this Baal? is basically what he's going to do. And Jesus, I believe the reason he gives her this brand of that Jezebel is this influential woman and her people that she was influencing, her leaders, were causing God's people to just become a little bit loose in life. Do you understand what I'm talking about here? Are we, are we clear? Now, what is interesting to me is this is not what Jesus is dealing with here. He's not dealing with her. He's not dealing with her messages or her leaders that she's influencing. He's dealing with the action, or I should rather say the inaction, of this church. This is the complaint. Look what he says. Look, I'm going to put it up again. He says, I have this complaint against you. You are permitting so now, look at this word permitting. The word permitting means this. It means you allow. You don't forbid. You do not put a stop to. You do not prevent. Okay, so basically, what he's, what he's correcting this church for is the fact that they are tolerating teaching and behavior that is contrary to sound doctrine, sound teaching. Are you with me? So, 
Obviously, Jesus gave this lady and her leaders time to repent. He obviously was dealing with this. But you know what? He is now past dealing with them. Because look what he said. He said, I gave her time to repent. So he's beyond that. He's not dealing with her anymore. He's saying, I'm dealing with the church for tolerating it. Okay? This is what he's sharply correcting them for. Tolerance. For putting up with issues that are causing God's people to go astray and not confronting them. So it would be like this church probably loved really positive teaching, really uplifting teaching, but they avoided any kind of correction. Are you tracking with me? Paul said in order to present every man perfect in Christ, we have to warn and we have to teach. Paul said to Timothy, in order to be a faithful servant of God, you have to not only exhort, but you have to correct. And you have to, to, have to address issues. Are you seeing this? So it kind of be like this. If we're all in a building that's on fire and it's burning down, but we choose to just encourage each other. Man, you're really doing well. I'm so, I'm, so, I'm so delighted with you. You are such a good brother. And the building burns down and we all die. Nobody got us out. Nobody addressed the issue at hand. This is what Jesus is dealing with with this church. There is another church father. His name is Jude. Jude had a similar situation. Look what he writes. He says, dear friends, I have been eagerly planning to write to you about the salvation we all share. But now I find that I must write. Now this is so interesting to me. Jude is like, man, I want to I share about all the encouragement of being saved. Man, how wonderful it is that we have God's spirit in us. We have the kingdom of God in us. We have grace to be able to succeed in life. I want to write about all this wonderful package of salvation, but I can't. He said, I have to write about something else. Okay, so what is he doing? He's not tolerating like the church of Thyatira. He's addressing. Because look what he says. I must write about something else, urging you to defend the faith. So now... He himself personally would like to talk about the wonderful, encouraging things of salvation. But he said, I can't. I have to confront. I can't avoid some of these issues that are going on. Then he says, I'm going to tell you. You have to defend the faith. In other words, you need to be confronting too. Are you seeing this? Defend the faith that God entrusted once for all time to his holy people. How are we supposed to defend the faith? Very next verse. I say this because some ungodly people have wormed. Now this word wormed in the New King James is much better. He says, they've crept in unnoticed into your churches saying that God's marvelous grace allows us, permits us to live immoral lives. Okay, now you can see this is the very same thing that's going on in Thyatira. We have a doctrine, a teaching. Doctrine just simply means a foundational teaching that is actually leading people away from a life of godliness. The true grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts and to live soberly and righteously in this age. What they're teaching is a grace that teaches all the positive aspects of grace, but doesn't teach the people. You are empowered now to walk away from you what used to enslave you. And so Jude has to say to them, address this, guys. Deal with this, guys. Don't avoid it. Don't tolerate it. Don't put up with it. Address it. Are you seeing this? Okay, and so... He says, uh, he says, basically, guys, here's the deal. You're allowing a permissive grace to be taught in your churches, not an empowering grace. Okay? What, what God has truly, what Jesus gave us when he was raised from, dead, from the dead, wasn't just a grace that forgave all of our sins, that delivered us from all judgment, eternal judgment, but it was a grace that empowered us to live a godly life. And that's what he said they're not teaching. 
What they're teaching is leading people into, hey man, you got, you got lust, you got desires, you got things that, it's okay, grace covers this. Are, are you with me? So when it comes to leadership, here's what I'm trying, here's the point I'm making. Silence is communication. Because what Jude is dealing with and what Jesus is dealing with is silence. Silence is nonverbal communication. In regard to leadership, what it does is it communicates agreement. And it grants permission when we don't address issues. There's an old Latin proverb, I love this, that says this, silence gives consent. He ought to have spoken when he was able to. If you think about it, John the Baptist lost his head for dealing with a guy's sexual preference. He didn't tolerate. He didn't avoid. He cared. I mean, would you stop and think about this? Judah saying, defend, defend the faith, defend the people. What is easier? If I protect a child from being kidnapped or if I allow that child to get kidnapped and now I gotta go rescue it. Sin is a kidnapper. It's a slave master. What is better if I speak out and protect people from this wickedness that's coming into America? Or if I allow people to get in bondage to it because I was not protecting, because I was silent, and now I gotta deal with getting them out of this. You still with me? So what's behind all this tolerance? Why, why, why don't we speak out? A misguided understanding of what the true love of God is is what's behind it. Look what Paul says. He says here in Ephesians 4, he says, We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Remember Jude said they wormed their way in? They crept in unnoticed? How do they creep in unnoticed? Their teaching is so close to the truth. But it's not. It actually ends up enslaving. Jesus said, hey, wisdom is justified by its children. Always look at the byproduct, the long-term byproduct of what you're teaching. Are lives being changed or are people in a club, but they still have the same bondages? You still with me? Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ. So what protects us from becoming one of the people that Jesus is addressing? I have this complaint about you. What protects us? Speaking the truth. But not just speaking the truth. Speaking the truth in love. There is a huge difference. Are you with me? It's not just speaking the truth. Because we have a lot of people that do that. And you know what they do? When you speak the truth without love, you know what it does? It leads you right into legalism. And when you have love without speaking the truth, it leads you into lies and bondage. Every road's got a ditch on both sides. And you know what? For some reason, we as the church want to swing to one side or the other. When are we going to learn it's the middle of the road we want to be at? We need both truth and we need love. We need them both. Can you say amen? So we steer clear. We avoid speaking certain spiritual truths because we view them outside of the love we so earnestly desire. The truths avoid us. They cause us to avoid people, calling people to a changed lifestyle. I'm not going to say that. 
just, it's, 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 gonna, it's gonna show that I'm bigoted, that I'm hateful. No. Does that child see you as bigoted and hateful if you're protecting it from being kidnapped? And going through the misery of the captors and the torture of the captors? So we view that kind of preaching as a lack of compassion. When in reality, that's the complete opposite. I think this video will illustrate what I'm talking about. Watch this. Hey, bro, look, check it out. Labradoodle. What? Yeah, what? right down there. Oh. <laughs> I love good breed. It's so good. Yes, half lab, half moodle. Wait, what? Incredible. Moodle? Yeah. No, that's moodle. not a thing ever. No, no, it totally is. A, a moodle. Isn't that, isn't that Dave from Econ? Oh, yeah. What is he doing up here? He's, he's probably just enjoying the view, man. Wait, isn't, isn't Dave blind? Warn him. Hey, hey, Dave. Whoa, 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 bro. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What are you doing? You, can, you can't just tell Dave what to do. Wait, why? Are you blind? Uh, no. Okay, so then you don't know what Dave's gone through. You can't really relate to him, man. Just, just, just let him be. He's totally fine. He's literally slipping right now. Yeah, wait, okay, you're gonna you're gonna get uh, all up on him for, for slipping. Like everyone slips from here and there. I don't it's care no if he slips. I'm just trying to keep it. a guy from falling off a cliff. No, no. Okay, listen. What what I think you need to do right now is you just need to love him. You need to not point out. What does that have to do with anything? It has everything to do with everything. Okay, like if you. If you point out his weaknesses, he won't feel loved, he won't feel accepted. I'm just, feel I'm just accepted. trying to keep a guy from going off the cliff. No, you're you, not even stopping. Hey, you're Dave! Not, no, whoa, 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 stop it, stop it, stop it! If you speak out against blind people, so what many people will be upset with you? with you. No, so many people won't like you. But also, what if, what if he doesn't like us anymore? You've ever thought about that? Dave will be dead. I need to say, hey, no, no, Dave! No, 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 Dave! No, 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 no. Someone, is someone there? Uh, yeah! Hey Dave, how's it going? It's uh, it's Charlie hey. from school. Oh hey man. I'm doing this for days. Uh, maybe you can help me out. I seem to have lost a trail somewhere. You you want to tell me if I'm going the right way? Maybe he is lost. Yes. You're right. We we should still just encourage him. Yeah yeah hey no, Dave you know you're doing great man. Uh, uh, you know I love that you're out here man too. I, I'm proud of you being out on this trail. You, you, you're doing great man. You, you're doing great. Oh. Okay, thanks, man. I say I'm going the right way. Watch, he'll figure it out. You just gotta love him through his problems. Yeah, you got it, man. Dave, what are you doing? What? Dave? 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 Does that illustrate the point? So they encouraged Dave. You know what they did? They made his last few steps more enjoyable, but they didn't save his life. Are we doing that in the church? Have we forgotten that there is a real hell? We more concerned about what people think about us, accepting us rather than speaking the truth. It goes back to the wedding reception that I spoke to you about last night. If you have a one day perspective, you're gonna eat every dessert on the table. If you have a six month perspective, you're gonna eat one or none of the desserts because you don't want the long term effect. Are 
we looking at life through the real eyes of eternity? I mean, look, look let's, just, let's just look at what the Bible says, okay? Revelations 20, 10, they'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. Matthew 25, 46, Jesus said these will go away into everlasting punishment. 2 Thessalonians, Paul writes, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. Hell was never created for human beings. It was created for the devil and his angels. But you see, the devil did a masterful plan in the Garden of Eden and took all humanity captive. Jesus came to rescue us. It's not a game. It's a real war. And it's eternal. Paul writes to the Corinthian church because these are the guys that are so 70, 80 year minded. And he said, don't you realize? I mean, he's like, he's like, guys, you are so on another page right now. Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not. Where is that scripture, guys? First Corinthians. Did they not put it in? Oh, gosh, they didn't put it in. Don't you realize? Just listen. Those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God. There is one, only one alternative. This is 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, New Living Translation. Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality. How can we be silent on these things? I'm first on the list. I was bound to pornography. At 11 years old, I would sit in high school classes and undress girls and go through the wildest fantasies. I got saved and I didn't get free. I still lusted. I was still bound to pornography. I got married and I was still lusted and still bound to pornography. I went into the ministry in 1983. I was still bound to pornography. But on May the 6th, 1985, God set me free and I'm free today. Do you want to know why? Because some godly men confronted me because they loved me. They didn't say, oh, it's okay. Grace covers it, John. It's going to be all right. It makes provision. We're all human. We have needs. They confronted me. And they said, John, we care about your eternal soul. One of them was Lester Summerall. I'm hosting him, I'm driving him a van, and he confronts me. And I got free, and I'm free today. I'm so glad that they didn't make up a doctrine that grace covers this. Just keep up, just keep going, it's okay. Now, don't get me wrong. I started from the moment I got saved crying out to God to be free, and it was a war. It was, because why? I'm already captive, and it takes time sometimes to get out of that captivity but I wasn't justifying my behavior with oh it's okay grace covers me I'm sitting there I'm crying out to God I'm like God I know there's an answer I know you're big enough to get me free from this I know the blood of Jesus is powerful enough to get me free from this so I struggled for about four years until I finally got it until God dealt with me and I write about it in this book extensively how I got free, why I couldn't get free for the four years. What was it that finally caused the breakthrough to come? You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. But if we have love without truth, nobody's getting free. They just feel better because they're in a good community. Are you with me? You know, at the wedding reception, people are going to look at me going, hey, John, come on, man. Enjoy life. Eat all those desserts. No, it's not enjoy life. It's enjoy the day. And that's what people are going to say. They'll cover it up with right statements, truth, so clever, or lies so clever that they seem like the truth. It may make you feel good. 
but it keeps you in bondage. So what is true love? 1 John 4, 8 says God is love. Are we the ones that define love? Seriously, it's ridiculous when you think about it. We're trying to define who and what God is. He is love. So don't you think he's the one that should define love? Right? So I'm out on the beach last year. I love the beach. It's the best place to pray. Man, you get out there early, nobody's on the beach, and you're walking down. I mean, it, it, oh, gosh. God, let me live on a beach. So I'm walking the beach, and the uh, Holy Spirit speaks to me. And he said, son, he said, my church has been focused on the peripherals of what love is, not the core. I was like, what? What? So let, let, let me explain to you what I'm talking about. The Bible says love is kind. Love is patient. Love is not jealous. Love is not boastful. It's not proud. It's not rude, etc. right? Can I tell you the truth? The world enjoys when a person's kind. The world enjoys when a person's patient. The world enjoys when a person's not proud. I mean, Roger Federer just won his, what, eighth Wimbledon singles title. Oh my gosh, people loved it. Why? Because he's a very, he's not a proud man. He's always putting, you know, giving credit to his opponent. I was just with a Swedish um, citizen, a citizen of Switzerland, excuse me, and they said, the press has never written a negative thing about Roger Federer. Why? Because he's such a humble man. So the world has all this in their love, in their love. You understand what I'm saying? See, see let me put it to you like this. If I look at a child, now, now just listen to me, and this child doesn't know the difference between a man and a woman. I say to this child, hey, a man has two eyes. A man has a nose. A man has two ears. A man has two legs. A man has two feet. A man has two hands. A child's going to look at a woman and say, there's a man. What I haven't done. What haven't I done? I haven't told the child the distinguishing difference between a man and a woman. Their reproductive organs, right? Well, this is what God was showing me. The church is majored in the peripherals. Love has two eyes, a nose, it has an ear. He said, but they haven't gone to the core difference between what is the difference between the love of the kingdom and the love of the world. And that is made so clear. Look at this. John says, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. There's your difference between the world's love and, and the kingdom's love. This is love that we walk according to his commandments. Those who accept my commandments. This is Jesus' words right here. This is Jesus speaking. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. Are you, are you getting this? So, so why is this love seem so right? I'm talking about the temporary love the peripherals that we focused in on. Why does it seem so right? The thing you gotta remember is that Eve wasn't deceived by the evil in the tree, she was deceived by the good in the tree. When she saw the tree was good, it would make her wise. And so her thoughts go down the road as, whoa, God is withholding something that is good from my husband and I from us. So what she did is she chose to accept what was good outside of the counsel of her maker. God is our maker and he knows what is good for us. So this love pops up when we, the created, say to the creator, I know better what is good for me. You still with me? See, here's the problem. Here's the problem. We want to know why. Okay, I've learned this about this millennials, and I love this about the millennials. You got to show me the why before I'll, I'll, I'll embrace something. Do you know there are some things that God just tells us, and he expects us to obey them just because of his character? 
that he is pure love and, and wants the, nothing but the best for us? Do you know there are things we just need to, I mean, can I tell you the truth? I've been saved almost 40 years, and in 40 years of trying to figure this out, I still cannot see the why in what God told the prophet of Judah. Look at this. Put it up, God. You must not eat or drink anything while you are, are there, and do not return to Judah by the way you came. Now, the prophet disobeys that because another older prophet told him, oh, it's not true. And that young prophet was eaten by a lion before he got back. That makes no sense to me. I can't in 40 years come up with the why of that one. But disobeying it, he got eaten by a lion. So guess what? I have news for all of us. There are times that God says, you gotta put all the whys aside and you gotta determine, do you trust my character? Do you trust that I am faithful? Do you trust that I want nothing for the best for you? Yes, yes, and yes. Can you say amen? amen. You still with me? So, true, so, so here's the deal. True love, now listen to me, true love can sometimes seem contrary to what feels like love. <laughs> Look what Paul said to the Corinthian church. He said, I will gladly spend myself and all that I have for you, even though it seems the more I love you, the less you love me. They thought he was too strong with them. They thought he was bigoted, bringing them under the rules, so to speak. And yet Paul was really loving this church because Paul was looking at life through an eternal perspective they couldn't see past the 70 or 80 years. But Paul said, the more I love you, the more you seem, the more it seems, the more, the less you love me, the more you think I don't love you. The more I love you, the more you think I don't love you and the less you love me. Sure is quiet here. Are you okay? <laughs> so I get saved. I go to work for a church. It was one of the most well-known churches in America. Back in 1983, June 20th is when I, I began working for that church. My job was I took care of the, the pastor and his wife and their guests. And I did that for four and a half years and you have to understand this was my nature this was this was me I hated with a passion confrontation I avoided confrontation like you would avoid poison I would tell people uplifting nice encouraging things even if it wasn't true and you know what the word was? Because I had a very visible position in this church. Words getting back to me. Oh, John Bevere is one of the most loving guys in the whole church. And you know, I, I'm starting to feel pretty good about it. <laughs> you know, it just really stroked those serotonin things. You know, what, what's that thing called when you look at Instagram, people are saying nice things. It releases some kind of, my boys will tell me later. <laughs> anyway, what is it called? Endorphins, okay. So it's stroking. So I'm in prayer one day, and the Holy Spirit says, hey, the people of the church say you're really a loving person, don't they? Now, normally, I would think, wow, I'm really happy he's saying this to me. But the way the Holy Spirit said it to me was kind of like going down a direction that was different. <laughs> and I said, yeah, yeah, people, people say that I'm a real loving guy. And the Holy Spirit said, you don't love them. I said, what? He said, you don't love those people. Oh, what? And he said, do you want to know why you tell people nice things? Do you want to know why you even tell people things that aren't true just because you don't want to say something that you think is mean? I said, why? It's because you fear their rejection. He said, so who's the focus of your love, you or them? I said, I guess I am. He said, if you really love people, you tell them the truth. So now, listen, the pendulum swung. Now, I'm telling people the truth, and I have no tact. I am harsh. 
I am cruel. And this went on for a while. And I'm actually out preaching at little hundred member churches and I'm literally bringing chaos in these churches. And I, I'm telling you in heaven, I'm gonna thank a lot of pastors for the cleanup jobs that they did after I left their churches. <laughs> because I now have zero compassion. And so this went on for the decade of the 90s. And, and, and at the end of the 90s, I'm doing a conference at a very prominent church in Europe. And after that conference, I heard from three different continents how that I beat the sheep. I don't love the sheep. I, I can't have him back. He beats, he beats the sheep up. There were actually a couple of very prominent churches that were getting ready to have me in, but that all stopped. And finally, when somebody from Africa said, John, this is being said about you. What's going on? Boy, I'm telling you what, you know what I did for the next several months? I went into the basement, and I, cr- I mean, I, I, I literally cried out, God put compassion in my heart for people. Now, I didn't realize what was happening, but I go back to a church that I hadn't been to in five years. And I, I, do, the, I do this conference for this church. It's in Montreal, Canada. And um, the pastor looks at me after the final service. He said, do you mind if I say something to you? I said, sure. He said, John, your, your message hasn't changed. You haven't softened your message, not even one iota. But he said, there's so much compassion that comes out of you when you speak. And I, I, I literally, I don't know if I did or not, but I, I, I think I teared up. I said, man, that's what I've been crying out for. You know one of the greatest revelations that God gave me? is a spoonful of sugar that helps the medicine go down. You ever, you know, you ever, I, I used to hear ministers say to me, oh, don't sugarcoat it, man. Oh, my gosh, sugarcoat it as much as you can. I mean, I can put sugar all over arsenic, but that arsenic's still going to kill me. And I can put sugar on medicine, and the potency of that medicine is not going to be diminished by that sugar. It's just going to make it easier to swallow. And I'm like, I pray. I'm like, God, get, the harder I preach, give me some more funny illustrations so people can know that, hey, this is a little bit easier coming down, you, you understand? But more than that, let them sense my real love and care for them. Because this is the thing, Jesus loves his church. I mean, he loves, he loves, the, he loved that woman Jezebel, whoever her name was. Can you imagine the heart of God, how it breaks when people don't listen to his wisdom? Because he knows the destruction they're bringing on themselves. Can you just imagine that? So let's look at this. With all that said now, love is kind. Love is patient. Love is not jealous. Love is not boastful. Love is not proud. Love is not rude. Love doesn't demand its own way. Love is not irritable. Love keeps no record of being wrong. Love does not rejoice about injustice. It never gives up. This is love. To keep his commandments. So if we speak the truth, but we're not kind, we're not patient, we're not, you know, uh, tender, we're rude, we're harsh, we're not keep, we're not speaking in love. We're not speaking the truth in love. If we're kind, if we're patient, If we're not rude, but we're not speaking the truth, we're not walking in love either. See, do you understand? It's like the pendulum swings. We just want to love people. We even give our names like love warrior. But yet we're not keeping the commandments. So is that really love? Because this is love to keep his commandments. Then we come over here and we're, oh, we're telling people you're going to go to hell if you don't try to repent. But yet we're rude, we're harsh, we got no compassion in our voice. We're not doing, saying it with tears. Is that love? No, because it's not kind. It's not patient. It's the whole package. What makes a man a man is the whole package, not just his reproductive system. It's the whole package. So it is kind. It is patient. It doesn't parade itself. It's not rude. But it speaks the truth. That's what the church needs. 
Paul says to Timothy, he says in 2 Timothy 4, 2, herald and preach the word. Keep your sense of urgency. You as a preacher of the word are to show people in what way their lives are wrong. Why? Because you care about them. Because you care too much to let them walk off the cliff. I've literally gone to churches. I went to a church, a prominent church. If I said the name, most of you would know the church. They wrote me an email three weeks before I came and said, John, we have a positive culture here. We're asking that when you speak from our platform and you address our church, that you would speak nothing but positively. I'm like, oh, wow. Okay. Let's encourage everybody while they're walking off the cliff. There's actually a pastor and his wife being interviewed, and they said, hey, it's not our job to tell people in what way their lives are wrong. I read this, and I go, whoa, 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 what? They actually said it's their journey. I'm like, wait a minute. Dave's journey ended up at the bottom of a cliff dead. I'm going to end with this. Paul made this statement. He said, I declare today, this is Acts 20, that I have been faithful. If anyone suffers eternal death, it's not my fault. Why is it your fault, Paul? Because I didn't shrink. I didn't avoid. From declaring all, not just the happy parts, all that God wants you to know. I declared the whole counsel of God, another translation says. So if anybody suffers an eternal death, it's not my fault. Can you believe the man was bold enough to say that? So the converse is true. If we don't preach the whole counsel of the New Testament, if people suffer eternal death, it is our fault. Their blood will be on our, their hands. I made that statement in a conference, a pastor's conference. I said, I don't want anybody's blood on my hands, so I'm gonna speak the truth. I had a pastor come up to me, senior pastor of a church in Canada. He was so irate. He said, how dare you put that Old Testament stuff on us? I said, excuse me? I said, would you open your Bible to Acts 20 and Adam read Paul say, I'm innocent of the blood of all people because I didn't shrink back from declaring you the whole counsel of God. And that senior pastor looked up at me and said, oh my, my, I have never seen that scripture before. How many times had he read it but not seen it? We have to be messengers, that love is pouring out of us, but we're not holding back the truth. Because a love alone does not set a person free. It's the truth spoken in love causes us to be free. Did you get something out of this today? Hey, if you're in here today and you'd say, you know what, I'm, I'm kind of like that person. I, um, I tell everybody encouraging positive things because I don't want to be rejected. Or if you're that person that says, you know, I'm a little harsh with people. I've not been walking very kindly. I don't care if you're in either category, but you say, man, my pendulum, I'm, I'm a little bit too close to one side or the other of the ditches. I want you to just stand up. I want to pray for you this morning. Just be, be, just be honest and stand up. Can you just lift your hands to heaven? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your Holy Spirit. You are the Spirit of truth. We're standing, I'm standing with my brothers and sisters right now, and I'm asking for a proper balance of kindness of the aspects of the love of God that you spoke to me that you said they were the peripherals but so important and that we would have the passion to not only keep but declare your word. Even the word of God that is not comfortable but will bring freedom and protection. Lord, there are 
men and women that are standing right now, they've avoided confrontation, they've avoided speaking the truth because they really do care, but they've cared more about themselves. They're repenting. And I'm asking that you would do in them what you did to me. And then there are people that are in here today that they've been harsh. They've spoken your truth, but they've not used godly tact. They've not spoken with a heart of compassion. I pray that you would do in them what you've done in me. I pray, Lord God, that we would all be like Jesus. I'm standing because I believe the work that you're doing in me is not complete. We want it to be that when somebody leaves our presence, that they will say, I feel like I've been in the presence of Jesus. And that's because they have been. Because we're vessels of honor and not dishonor. I'm asking now, Holy Spirit, grant this prayer for all of us standing. And we are grateful for what you've done in our lives today. In Jesus' name. Now, Father, I pray for every person that's going out in the outreach. What a time, what an opportunity to show kindness, to show patience, to not be rude or proud or boastful or arrogant, but to also declare the word of God in truth and to not hold back the counsel. Lord, I pray that our actions today of service would speak so loudly of our love for these men and women of our community here in Tulsa that they would be overwhelmed by the love of Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing today and every day in this church. And may your work continue in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody that agrees says amen. Amen. Let's thank God one more time.